The new Ugreen NAS offering has generated a lot of interest and as of now, August 20th, 2024, is officially shipping. So now is a good time to reflect on its current state and talk about what you will get if you purchase. When I received my NASSYNC DXP6800 Pro NAS from Ugreen in April to test, I have to say I was excited about it and there's a few reasons why. Firstly, I was excited there was a new entrant coming into the NAS space which has been primarily dominated by names like Synology and QNAP, with some others gaining traction like TerraMaster, but there was something different about this and why I was excited and why there's been a buzz about the product. Secondly, what was different was that Ugreen were coming into this with what seemed to be some serious budget behind them. They have a good business selling cabling, USB docks, charges, and power banks, etc. And they do seem to be moving up the value stack. And when I say budget, it looks like they were doing this properly. A good range of well-engineered and very capable products with some marketing budget behind it also. And certainly, they've made an impression with their Kickstarter, which during the funding period from March to May 24, attracted 7 million US dollars pledged from over 13,000 participants. And there's been a buzz also in forums and on Reddit also. And thirdly, they seem to not be entering with a cheaply built product or a small entry level product to test the market. They're coming in with possibly the top spec seen for a home or SMB NAS, a broad range of products from flash only up to 8 bay NAS and products that look slick, they have great hardware specs and they appear to be well designed and built. So why has it taken so long for me to get to a video about it? Well, let's talk about that. Because of what I learned about this product, I think it's important to break this review down into three separate parts. Hardware, software and support. Though the hardware hasn't changed over the last few months, the other items certainly have. And the product's also been delayed in its release, but has now finally been released in just the last few days, so we can get into why this is and what you can expect from the product now. So let's get straight to the hardware and see what we get in the box and how polished it looks. So first impressions are really good. There's an outer shipping box and then inside there's some really nice retail packaging. Certainly not something you'd expect from a Kickstarter. And we're gonna come back to why this has its genesis on Kickstarter in a bit. Inside the packaging is also good, protecting the device well from damage. And there is any reason to think that what's gonna ship now is any different than what I received. Once we get the device out of the box, we can see it looks really nicely put together. It's a solid, all brushed metal construction with a really nice two-tone gray color and it's physically heavy and you can see this is good or bad but it certainly feels like it's solidly built the drive bays are clearly numbered which i'm a big fan of the drive leds are not on the drive caddies themselves which is a bit of a shame but given the numbering it's not really a big deal the leds are addressable rgb which is small but nice touch so the colors can be changed such as the highlighter drive and they can be dimmed to be less intrusive this again is minor, but I think it gives a taste to the quality put into the physical build. The unit I have, which is a six bay NASSYNC DXP6800 Pro, has six drive bays at the front, along with two Thunderbolt 4 ports, a USB 3.2 Gen 2 port, and an SD 4.0 slot. Around the back, we have power for an internal PSU, so there's no power brick, which is nice. And then you have two Aquantia 10 gigabits per second Ethernet ports. And Aquantia has a solid history in 10 gigabits per second Ethernet hardware. And it's owned by Marvel. So there's some solid networking, which we're going to put to the test later. There's also another USB-A 3.2 Gen 2 port and a couple of USB-A 2.0 ports. And then an HDMI 2.1 output. Smaller units will have different I.O. on them. For example, the USB ports and the HDMI ports and the smaller versions will probably be a bit less. And all of these are cooled by two fans at the rear of the chassis blowing straight through the six hard drive bays. Underneath, the NAS has a hatch which provides access to two NVMe bays. And these can be used to create either high speed storage pools or to create storage cache for the array. And we're going to come back to these later as there's more to talk about here. And overall, the unit feels physically very finished. I have some small concerns about the lack of cooling in the space where the NVMe's fit but very thick heat pads are provided to help transfer heat from the SSDs out there to the metal outer. Inside the DXP6800 Pro, it has its six three and a half inch bays. Although you can fit SSDs in the bays, I think it's most naturally suited to spinning disks just to maximize capacity. If performance is a key requirement, you can use volumes or caching in the NVMe slots. The device is not just suited to basic NAGS functionality, um, it's gonna be a really solid basis for other services such as VM or container hosting a media center and for a surveillance capability, the latter of which is planned for later this year, but it's not yet included. And to that end, Ugreen has built some really solid performance hardware for this class of device. They're using a 12th gen Intel i5 1235U processor, which comes with eight E cores, efficiency cores, and two P cores. 
performance cores and the P cores are multi-threaded so it delivers 12 threads in total. And this is all based on the Alder Lake architecture and it also includes the Intel Iris XE GPU which comes with AT execution units and this provides good capabilities for output from the HDMI for playing 4K content. They claim it will do 8K, this is not something that I tested. They also include 8GB of DDR5 4800MHz RAM and this is expandable up to 64 and this is especially good if you're going to be hosting VMs or containers. So if I compare this to the hardware from other NAS providers, it's powerful and it's capable. For example, if we put this against the 6 base Synology DS1621 Plus, it has a lot more CPU grunt, it has twice the installed and max memory, it has two times the 10 gig networking compared four times one gig on the Synology, and it has far more capable IO. These were originally offered about the same price, but it looks like Ugreen currently has this unit at 1200 USD. But the problem here is that you can't really compare these devices like for like, and this is why the prices vary. If you just want a NAS and a media center, all of these would have similar capacity and would provide similar capabilities, but the Ugreen offering provides significantly more CPU and memory and far better I.O. performance. So if you want something to run VMs or containers or applications that require more grunt, the Ugreen is going to better justify its price. You could build your own, but the form factor and the hardware is compelling. So looking at the full I.O. potential, we can start to see where this device could shine for performance. As mentioned, it comes with the two 10 gigabit Ethernet adapters, which can run at one or two and a half gigabit speed also. And you can bond these into a 20 gigabits connection. And we're going to talk more about that in a bit. Now the two NVMEs inside, you can run one of those at PCIe Gen 4 times 4 speed and the other at PCIe Gen 3 times 2 speed. So one will support about eight gigabytes per second of IO and the other about two gigabytes per second. But that said, I, I think personally this is just fine. You know, if you're using the NVMe for NAS storage volume or a cache, then actually two gen three lanes is gonna get you most of the way towards saturating both of those 10 gigabits per second links anyway. If you're using the NVMe for high performance disk access for local VMs and containers, then you can use the slot with the four, four times gen four capacity. The chipset itself has a total of 12 Gen 3 lanes and 8 Gen 4 lanes and there's plenty of I.O. provision on the NAS using those twin gigabit networking, the NVMe slots as well as Thunderbolt 4, USB 3.2 and the USB 2 interfaces. So the unit seems to run pretty quietly overall but if you do put the NAS under load you definitely do hear no more noise from the fans but generally from a hardware perspective I'm really impressed. Okay so let's move on to the software which Honestly, I think really is where the focus needs to be. The hardware is crucial and obviously it's very hard to retrospectively fix problems, but the software is the thing that people are going to interact with on the most regular basis and it's the thing they experience day to day, so it's really important. And I believe this is where we discover why this project has been delayed and I think also it tells a big part of the story about why this was a Kickstarter project. Ugreen clearly have an aspiration to come in and shake up the NAS market and they want to propel themselves into a position as a major player. And I'm going to start off by saying that I believe they're going to succeed in this. However, writing software is complex and understanding a new market segment is also non-trivial. The NAS Sync software is clearly modeled on what makes others such as Synology successful, but it has taken a long time for those players to build and get their software where it is. Doing this as a Kickstarter not only allowed a new marketing channel, but it also gives them time to assess the interest and justify investment in the software. And why do a Kickstarter for hardware that's already built? Well, I think it turns out that a lot of the heavy lifting is actually on the software side. And for what I've seen that we're going to talk about next, they've been really busy with this over the last few months. When I first got the unit, you know, my first impressions were really good. Uh, but when I started doing real hard testing in April, I ran into issues that made the testing a little bit frustrating. You know, for example, I'd set up an SMB share and then it would take a long time before I could even access the share. I would make some changes to the shares and the network mounts would be disconnected. My SSH session would get disconnected and I wouldn't be able to recover it until the unit had been rebooted. So there's quite a few of these kind of issues. Also, there were just general what I would call quality of life issues, such as, you know, raid rebuilds were not telling you how long it would take to complete. Um, there was an option um, to add a, a drive to expand an array and it was the recommended option, but it wasn't actually available and you couldn't do it. And there were also some general pain points such as having to accept terms and conditions every time we log in and the UI not allowing a user to paste a password in, which I think is likely done with the best intentions, thinking it's more secure, but it's not. And it just promotes the use of simple, memorable passwords. 
And I would say that this is fixed today at the login screen where it's more acutely obvious, but you know, there are some actions elsewhere in the UI that require passwords such as modifying storage volumes and it still has to be typed. So there's some more to be done there. I have been upgrading the firmware regularly and I can say that these issues are getting fixed and the software is getting better and better. There's still some quirks, but stability is vastly improved and usability is also far better. Things like the performance graphs didn't make sense and now they do. And there's some really great new functionality such as the ability to create and manage virtual machines natively without installing third party apps like VirtualBox. And the phone app is far more expansive and it's actually really good to use. So is this finished? No, but few software products ever are in truth and Ugreen will need to continue to add needed functionality. Things like migration from RAID 5 to RAID 6 is not yet supported, but I'm told it's coming. Um, and things that I love about Synology and TerraMaster, such as the flexible drive use in array, such as SHR and T-RAID, you know, capabilities like that will also need to be added to catch up. But, and, and I'm personally also a big user of the surveillance app from Synology, and Ugreen say that they have one coming later this year. But from what I've seen with the upgrades, they're working really hard to close the gaps and they are making genuine progress. Security is also, I think, a really important part of a NAS, especially if you are developing your own OS. Other brands have been hit in the past by ransomware and these type of things. So a new vendor in this space has to apply laser focus to this area. Again, improvements here with specific configuration around security settings, such as automatic IP blocking, unblocking after a certain number of logins, firewall capabilities, etc. But personally, I don't have any of my NASs exposed to the internet and I wouldn't expose this one to the internet either personally. Upgrades, they also got far easier. Previously, all my patch notes were in German, and this is probably because I'm based in Europe and Germany is a key part of European operations for Ugreen, but now they're in English and upgrades failed for a while at some point due to patching infrastructure being down, but that is also now not been a problem in months. And they've also added out of band upgrades, which is important to me as I prefer to limit internet access. So great improvements here also. Um, so you're getting the gist here that the software has been a bit buggy and immature, but that it's definitely getting much better. And I think Ugreen have done the right thing in delaying release for these reasons. They know there are gaps in the user experience and in functionality, and they want to get it right before they release it. For me, this is a really good sign, and I'm happy to see evidence of what looks like a lot of hard work from them in lifting their game in this area. So on that basis, let's talk quickly about the current status so you can get a sense for some of the things that still need ironing out. So I ran performance testing to the NVMe over a 10 gigabits per second interface, and I had no throughput issues here getting a full max 10 gigabytes per second to and from the device. However, link aggregation was a bit of a pain and it's something I'm going to have to test in more depth. However, the real observation here is I'm forced to add two links to the bundle and you may say, of course it's link aggregation, but actually I want to add one. I want to check it's configured correctly and working before I add the other. Or if the config is wrong, I lose access to the device to correct it. And this is a minor user experience oversight, but it can lead to unneeded frustration. And these UX issues exist in other areas. For example, if I'm going to use two interfaces with different IPs, I'm forced to specify a default gateway on both, which doesn't make sense. The Linux OS doesn't require this, so this is an input validation check that just isn't fully thought through. Same for DNS. I have to apply both DNS servers to save the configuration, even if I don't need DNS for what I'm doing. So I just have to put in fake DNS IPs. In some cases, the networking gets broken and you have to reboot the box to recover it, like here. And this also looks to be why I had issues with link aggregation configuration. And in this case, actually, it was the issue was far worse and I had to go in via the console and I had to manually edit the interface configuration to be able to recover the access to the box. And this involved having a keyboard plugged in to the front and using control or F1 to access and log into the console, going in and editing the file that configures the interface, removing the network configuration from the second interface and setting it back to DHCP and looking at the network config, by the way, it looks okay. So it's hard to say what the issue was, but clearly something broke and the correct validation checks were not done. And these are really simple things that just need fixing and they exist in various places. But again, lots of these already have been fixed. So Ugrain just needs to continue to iterate, absorb the feedback and crank out these improvements. So now let's talk about what's good about the capabilities in the platform. So the standard NAS capabilities and network storage over protocols like SMP work fine, as you would expect. First of all, I love the VM capabilities. It was very straightforward to get Linux and a Windows VM running. And this is likely because they built native tooling for VM management, which is better than trying to package a third party app. And if you want an all-in-one device for both NAS 
and running apps and hosting VMs and these type of things, this is where the device really shines because of the significant performance advantages it has over the likes of products from Synology. You can also create and manage containers. And again, this is exposed as a native application. Some Docker related tasks I did do at command line because I couldn't really work out how to do them through the UI. So there's a little bit to be done there, but generally it works great. And I'm gonna be upgrading the RAM in my unit because the container and VM capabilities are something that I intend to use. And especially with the disk IO option the NAS has, this is where it really differentiates. Media management, that's really nice. I can manage my library, view my 4K content directly in the browser app. And the Ugreen phone app also seems really polished. Everything appears to be in one place here so I can manage the status of my containers and VMs. I can view and back up my phone photos, manage my media library, control 4K playback directly from the NAS HDMI port, or play directly on my phone, manage the NAS, etc. In fact, all the apps accessible via the web desktop appear to be in here. If I'm playing video via the HDMI, there's a neat little tooltip that gives me access to get straight to the controls from the app. So this again has been really well thought out. And probably the last thing, that if you doubt the readiness of the software for any reason, Ugreen have confirmed that the hardware warranty is not affected if you choose to run alternate software. So given that the hardware's platform seems really solid, you can simply run something like TrueNAS on the hardware until such time that you want to run the native software. And the smaller units come with two years warranty and the higher end units like this one, they come with three years warranty. You could just go and run your own NAS and use all that great hardware. And this brings me to the last section, which is about support. But before we do, please take a moment to like this if it's been useful. And also please do consider a subscribe to get more of my content on storage, compute and other NAS related topics. I will continue to share deeper content on the Ugreen NAS as it develops. And this is a huge help in growing my small channel. So thank you very much. So firstly, Ugreen have experience with hardware support and I've heard good things about this. What they have less experience with is software support. And initially the support channels didn't look particularly helpful. There was WeChat or a Shenzhen phone number. I did attempt to contact support when I couldn't get upgrades working and people really did try to help, but I kind of got sent all over the place and never really got the help I needed. But from working in the industry myself, I know that your support function gets stood up ready for release and it's not going to exist months in advance. Now the support pages look way better and there's local support numbers in Asia, the US and Europe. And again, this seems to be moving in a really good direction. Um, originally, there was kind of a lot of Chinese text around the UI, but this seems to have gone and all seems to be really well localized now. The support pages look a lot more extensive. And looking at the dates on articles, there's been some really solid work to build out the knowledge base over the last few months, and it's looking good. Also, there's more tooling available in the help section, such as tools to generate diagnostic information and enable debugging modes, etc. So in summary, with the product now released, it's really compelling option for home NAS if you want some extended capabilities like the native media apps and the ability to use this for things like VM and containers. It looks like there's some corners that still need smoothing off, but the product is really well on its way to being very polished. And the delay and the progress tells me that they've made a commitment here. I do understand it's only gonna be initially available in the US and Germany, and it sounds like shipping to other countries won't even be offered, um, but I do hope it's broadly available soon. There are actually some links down below where you can find it, and I'll update these as availability changes, but right now, for example, the link I have doesn't appear to work in the UK, but it does work in the US. Um, so I look forward to digging deeper into these product capabilities as they grow and sharing them with you, and I will have a lot more content to come on this. And of course, I will see you in the next.